Welcome to our AMC Q&A with, uh, with Gillian and uh, a racy lady. I'll, I'll describe it as a, a lady who spent a life involved in horsepower. It's going to do a little bit of introduction to those that you that don't know uh, Gillian and her background. Um, you've been described, Gillian, as a, a formidable lady, probably from your involvement in largely male-dominated male uh, competitive sports way back in the uh, 19, early 1970s. Uh, you've combined a, compassion, a passion for um, equestrian events and motor cars. And uh, living on a farm, you've been competing in point to points for various owners quite early on, but uh, that stopped due to foot and mouth epidemic at the time and horse racing and point to pointing uh, was stopped. Uh, but there was still rally cross going on in the country. So naturally you went down and had a look at this rally cross and quite reasonably thought to yourself, and I quote, I could do that. Um, you bought a Ford Anglia, which was a complete disaster, so we'll just gloss over that one for the moment. Um, but you could see or you spotted that, uh, very correctly, that a TBRs were doing very, very well at the time. So you decided to, a TBR would be a great car to have. Uh, bought a copy of Autosport, as you still do, and as luck would have it, in the back under sports car advert, there was a TBR Griffith advertised for £800. And in your own words, you cheekily went to the bank manager and convinced him it was a great investment to go car racing and sell it afterwards for a profit a year later, um, which is exactly what you did. Uh, you were quite successful in that. Uh, you did sell it and made a little profit on it, but that appeared to be the end of your driving career because you had no car and you'd had no money because you'd paid back to the bank. Somebody slipped uh, a telephone number into your hand of an S Turner, a Stuart Turner. Uh, you didn't know who this was and you thought he was probably somebody who swept the floors at the Ford competition department as you put it um, uh, but they were looking for ladies for a televised rallycross championship and you rang the number and was surprised that Stuart Turner himself answered the phone and I think your quote was I hear you're looking for lady drivers for an all-girls rallycross team at Lydon on the television he said, what makes you think you can drive? You said, I've just won some autocross races and a Formula 1200 race. Well, I suppose I better give you a test. And this led you quite quickly to be competing in the Ford Mexico Championship as a works driver against a guy whose name you couldn't pronounce. Uh, go to think it was Brands Hatch and he'd beaten you to pole position, which you were pretty annoyed about, I recall. Uh, we understand from the time. Um, perhaps you could tell us about that event and uh, surprised us at the end as to who that person was that beat you to pole position but about that race, Gillian. Yeah, well, it was not the first race of that season. Uh, Ford had the Ford, es the four Ford Escort Mexicos left over from the Rallycross and they wanted to start a racing championship. So they lent out the four cars, uh, one to me, one to Motor Magazine, one to Roger Clark's brother, Stan, who'd helped with the four wheel drive Capris down at Lydon and another one to this um, foreigner um, who was on a scholarship from South Africa. And that's a hint. And uh, for the first couple of races, I remember I went up, I drove the car up to Croft and then there was Croft and Ruffer very close together. And I slept in the Mexico. It was early in the year. It wasn't very comfortable. It was really cold and uncomfortable, but um, the car had a misfire. So the whole thing was not very good and I didn't feature at all. Um, but then down at Brands Hatch, I discovered that uh, having whinged to Stuart Turner and the competitions department that my car had a misfire and I couldn't keep up. They basically implied that I probably wasn't going through the corners quick enough and that's why I was getting overtaken. But uh, then they found out that I had a, not got the carburetor modification that everybody else had. And so they put me right and I went off to Brands Hatch and I was determined to make a mark at Brands Hatch. Uh, Brands Hatch was the local circuit and uh, being farming at the time and it was not a particularly early practice so I think I milked the cows a bit early that day and then went off to Brands Hatch. Uh, as you said I was annoyed that I got beaten to pole position by Jodie Schechter as it turned out to be. Um, to put this in perspective this is this is 1971 and the following year Jodie Schechter was in Formula One and by yeah, 1979 he was Formula One world champion for Ferrari. Yes he was on his way he came over from South Africa. Where were you? Um, with a Formula Ford, a Ford Escort Mexico and a Formula 3 car um, and ba basically I had a slightly better start and um, second on the grid at Brands is quite advantageous and um, and basically Jody's view into, Brand, into Paddock Bend wasn't particularly uh, nice for him so he backed off and tucked in behind and then he had to deal with people like 
Jerry Marshall, Barry Williams and others. So um, they kept him busy for nine and a half laps, but he managed to claw his way out of their clutches and came and challenged me on the last lap and fair hands up. I mean, he, he, he nipped down, uh, he sold me a pup into pa paddock and uh, I was very green. And uh, uh, he no disrespect to any of the names you've mentioned there, but uh, th there's a reason people win Formula One World Championships. And it was obviously, obviously showing his mettle there, wasn't he? Jody was always, always just that whisperer quicker through every single corner without making mistakes. You add all the whispery parts of a second together for a lap, and then you multiply that by a 10 lap race. And, and it wasn't surprising that he, he often uh, was clear. He was brilliant. Now this led to you having a, a full-time works drive with Ford. So you became a full-time driver with them. And you did a lot of work with uh, Escort and Capris developing uh, an engine that we, I believe was destined for uh, Formula 2, but as you put it uh, elsewhere, it's, you're on record as saying uh, it was a fabulous engine, but put in a rubbish Escort. Yes, it was It was an old um, dog of a car, very heavy old car that was at the back of Borum, and they just used it as a sort of mobile test bed. And the car, the engine wasn't homologated, um, for form, so it couldn't run in international races, so it went club racing. And the best thing about that was not only it was a wonderful engine, but also I had an association with Don Moore because Don Moore and his mechanic Dickie uh, were in charge of the car. And that was, that was lovely. Don was a wonderful gentleman with a terrific racing history. Um, the car was a bit rubbishy to drive. It understeered like a pig and uh, it was very, very heavy to drive. Uh, in fact, when it was sold later on, I think it went to Ireland and when they got it out of the um, docks, they rang me up and said, we think there's, it's been damaged in transit because it's really hard to drive. <laughs> No, it's normal. That's how it was. That's how it was. Now, of course, this uh, this led to you um, being in the 1972 British Grand Prix support race, which, of course, Jody Shetter was in the British Grand Prix by then. Um, yes. And you, uh, I think you had um, you had an interesting day. I think you used quite a number of engines on that day, didn't you? Not you in particular, but just the, uh, the, the, the car. What happened at the end of the uh, development year with the two litre aluminium BDA for Formula 2 is I, I did whinge about the chassis and they said, well, don't worry, just put up with it because next year we're going to build you a brand new works 1300 BDA Escort for you to contend you know, a decent championship with. And, uh, and the car was fabulous. And the engine was a 1300 BDA and uh, it kept breaking down, uh, which was disappointing. I think I, um, I didn't finish any of the races. I, I remember breaking down at Thruxton and I think Vince Wolfman, I think was in another 1300 BDA a privately entered one and that broke down as well. Um, however, we went to the British Grand Prix support race and there were two qualifyings and the race and it chewed an engine in each of the qualifying uh, sessions. So third engine was put in, which was in fact one that Don, Don Moore had had something to do with and it lasted the race, but afterwards they stripped it down and it, I think it had another lap in it and that was all. Um, so it was disappointing. So not, not content with being a Ford Works driver in the British Grand Prix support race, you also did the 1972 Spa 24-hour race. And in those days, uh, that was over the daunting full Spa circuit, which is twice the length it is now, off through the Ardennes and its own microclimate. Quite extraordinary. I think you had a, uh, you, you shared with a, a leading Belgian lady driver then, just the two of you. Uh, and nowadays it's three or four drivers on half the circuit. You did it with two does. But uh, yeah, I think you had a view about um, if you broke down at Spa, you needed, what was it you think you needed? A phrase book and uh, some sandwiches? A phrase book, some sandwiches and uh, enough money for a bus pass back. <laughs> I mean, it, it was daunting. Um, Yvette Fontaine, who was uh, a top Belgian driver in her own right, was stunning at Spa. That was her circuit. She knew every inch of it. And because it's such a fast circuit, you needed to know where you were going. There was no point having a look around the corner and then going. Uh, and she was quick. Um, and it took all the time to sort of get on the pace, really. And uh, as I can remember Jerry Burrell saying, I can't believe it, I'm nowhere near her time. But you'd need to know Spa. And it was very, very, very fast, um, daunting circuit. And at high speed, when you hit the white lines um, on the way down to Malmody, you know, it would shift the car over. It was, qu it was quite a, an education. But uh, we lasted 21 and a half hours. Uh, before we had uh, um, an engine failure and um, at one stage we were leading the class so regrets it's, it's not not uh, not too bad a, a, an attempt is it to say the least it well it, well, it isn't a finish um, and um, one of the most <laughs> annoying things like is, a true driver <laughs> yeah yeah there you go failure
Um, so you you did you did that side of stuff, but it, it was um, Ford by this point were wanting you to go rallying as well, weren't they? Yes, I mean one of the things with Ford was that um, not only was there quite a, a substantial um, program of racing, but he also had to do various sort of odd things like going on forums and uh, I spent quite a lot of time mixing it with um, Graham Hill and I was the sort of female counterpart when they invited uh, anybody invited Graham to do something they'd have a lady counterpart and so I saw quite a lot of Graham and he was always great fun to be with um, Roger Clark and co and uh, I got to know Roger through the rallycross at Lydon but then Ford said uh, you're going rallying and I said well I don't want to go rallying uh, I didn't join motorsport to go rallying if I had I would have started rallying and they said, well, not a lot of options. You're going rallying, um, but we're going to give you a good navigator. Uh, we're going to give you Tony Mason, who just won the RAC with Roger Clark. So um, it was the year after that. And uh, I went rallying for a brief time with Tony, who was a brilliant navigator and great company. But um, I, I, I didn't like driving on public roads flat out because being a farming background country person, I, I always think there could be a sheep or a cow around the corner or a vet or a midwife on an emergency call. So I really didn't dial in very well to it. They said, you'll love it, you'll love it when we go to the Kielder Forest because then you haven't got uh, any traffic. Uh, but lo and behold, you go to the Kielder Forest. And in those days, the crowds used to line the track and then come out into the middle of the road to see you coming and then disappear back around the corner uh, at the last minute. And when you're trying to set a car up to go into a corner, you know, you have to basically sort of unstable it and get it oversteering and then know where the apex is and it was quite difficult and I, I just didn't like the crowd risk uh, again so I, I couldn't wait to stop rallying but uh, they, were, they were right at the edge of the road in those days weren't they yeah yeah they, they were they were everywhere they were taking pictures on the exit of the corners or on the inside coming to the track um, and I hadn't got the mentality um, some rally drivers said you have to think of them as soft trees and I couldn't do that I think that was Michel Mouton, wasn't it, later on? But uh, I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, rallying was great fun, and I had the technique. This is why Ford sent me rallying. Um, I had the technique because I didn't mind sliding around. Uh, uh, and it would be, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great sport. And I think the rally drivers are actually a much more complete driver than racing drivers. I have to say that. I think they're absolutely brilliant. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, I think it's fairly well, fairly well accepted. The um, One of the other things that Ford wanted to do as well, which was the, um, obviously you, you're beholden to them because you're a works driver, you're an employee at this this point, um, was that they, they wanted to promote you very much on the all-female races, which uh, again, didn't uh, didn't float your boat, did it so much? No, no. I, I mean, I've never, I've never wanted to be thought of as um, anything other than just a competitor, whether it be in equestrian events, where there are no... Um, barriers um or in motorsport and uh whilst i think this this new formula for women single seaters is is very interesting and very you know it's well supported and and, and there's some really good girls in it uh, but why it's like um i have to say it's a bit controversial i didn't want to join and haven't uh joined the british women's racing drivers club now there are some really good girls in there but i, I belong to the aston martin owners club i'm i'm a club member what, why have a, they don't have a men's club. If they did, there'd be an uproar from the feminists. Um, no, I just think that we're competitors, we're people. All you need to drive is um, two hands, two feet, and probably only half a brain. Uh, so <laughs> why separate people? <laughs> there, there, there are some male drivers that aren't that well qualified, but uh, we won't comment on that. Um, so just before we get on to the Aston Club stuff, which is obviously what we know you for, but just to finish off, you, you then, uh, for various reasons, you, you left Ford, you moved back down to Dorset, and as uh, you put, you you, uh, you decided to chuck it in and, and return back to your your first love of horses. Uh, and again, it was an interesting times. It was nineteen late nineteen seventy five by then, and you'd had five years as Ford at Ford as a works driver in development, and you got involved in steeplechasing. And there was an Act of Parliament change in November nineteen seventy five that allowed uh, the Jockey Club to issue lady ladies with licenses, which you didn't run to to go and do because you've said you're not a feminist, but the, the trainer that you work for did. And what's what's the story behind that? Well, um, in 1975, uh, I was riding a, a, a novice horse, uh, which I developed a great partnership with. And to this day, I think he was the best horse I rode. Uh, and I produced him as a novice. And in 74, I rode him as a novice a few times. 
And then in 75, he grew up, he was a um, year older, year stronger. And he came into training at the farm where I was based in Dorset and uh, with a really good team around me and so on. And I came out with this no novice horse and I won um, all seven races on him, which was quite something, which is why I got the uh, horse that I, that I rode in 1976. That was called, he was called Stanhope Street. He'd been a really good horse in his youth. Uh, and then he, he was 12 years old and everybody thought he was past it because the last time, last season he had racing, he was a complete disaster and uh, everyone said, well, he's a write off. But the owner sent him down to Dorset and with the help of my great friend, Jane, who was training at Great Ormond Street at the time, uh, I used to send Jane off hunting all Saturday with him. And I used to hunt him in the week and we trained him and he came out and he was as good as ever. So the owner, uh, I went in two point points and won those. And the owner said, well, due to his past form, he was eligible for the champion hunt chase at Cheltenham, a Cheltenham week, not just any old race meeting. Uh, it was the Cheltenham big festival meeting. And it was a champion hunter chase, which was one up from the fox hunters. So it was a huge, huge ask. And that was my first ride um, in rules, uh, against rules. And there was a lot of publicity and a lot of uh, opposition, really, from people in the horse world. And they kept saying, you know, aren't you frightened? You know, and I said, I've been motor racing for years and, and just let the people who want to do it get on with it and uh, judge on the results. So you'd, you'd, you'd race against Jerry Marshall, so a horse isn't going to frighten you, is it? Yeah, that's a fair old training, isn't it? <laughs> John um, Franklin is a lot nicer than Jerry Marshall to be against. <laughs> and there's a bit of a theme developing here, Gillian, that, you know, people, you, you, you say it was a male dominated world at the time, certainly in 1970, 71, when you started, you ended up being a Ford works driver and raced against people like Yodi Shept, who went on to be a Formula One world champion. You, you go to horses and you end up at Cheltenham. Uh, and if I'm, I think, correct in my in my research, that you are uh, in 1976, you're 76, you became the first uh, female national champion steeplechase jockey. Yes, yes. Thanks to Stanhope Street and the team around uh, who helped, you know, with his um, revitalization, I think it was. It was it was quite it was quite a big thing at the time. Um, yeah, we, we, we ran him uh, nine times, had six wins and three seconds. So that after winning seven out of seven on Prince Rock were two fantastic years. Um, anyway, after that, um, I had other things on my mind and uh, I basically chucked it. I've always, I've made mistakes in my life and, and one of the biggest mistakes, or maybe it wasn't, I don't know, was that whenever any competitive career decisions came along um, and the balance was whether to focus on domestic matters or career matters, racing matters, I always went down the domestic route. And that was probably a mistake, but uh, you can never say, hindsight's a great thing. Um, but I stopped everything and moved to Wiltshire, which is where I am now. And um, then I took up an offer to drive uh, for Terry Granger with his HWM. He had asked me back in the early seventies and I was just too busy and too stressed out, um, really. Uh, I was unbeknown to everybody else on the receiving end through no fault really of that person uh, with an illness or condition that I was on the receiving end of a huge amount of domestic abuse which was behind the scenes and that was not nice um, devastating and I moved to Wiltshire and focused on just uh, restoring this cottage and then I had this invitation to drive again for the, the HWM and I took them up on it and that started a whole load of motoring Again, which was lovely, actually. I think uh, if it hadn't been for that invitation, I would have been quietly uh, uh, milking my house cow and feeding chickens. But no, back in it again. And that was great. The introduction to HWM was uh, life changing. Which brings, brings us nicely into how we know you all. Um, that was a little bit of the background, but it brings you into, into the Aston Club. And um, obviously, that's what we know you for, and that's, that's why we're here. Um, how did you get involved in the Aston Club, Gillian? Right, well, the HWM was uh, I, I drove it in Midlands hill climbs and the owners wanted to, uh, seeing that I was capable of being competitive, they wanted to have a car that was capable of taking the class and class records. And they asked me to find a Lotus 23B, which I did, competed in that. And uh, they wanted to go down to uh, try their hand at uh, running a car in a sprint. They never ever raced the, their car because they didn't want the risk. And so lo and behold, they entered me for the Aston Martin Owners Club Sprint at Goodwood and with the Lotus 23B. And I think you were there. For those that don't, don't know, in those days, Goodwood had closed down. It had 
stopped racing back in 1966. So it was used for sprints only, so i.e. not races. And the difference with that is, um, if you've not experienced one of these, is they were called pursuit sprints. And what they did was they put four cars on the grid at the time with a, uh, I think it was 20, 10 or 20 second delay between each car. Mm. And basically because of the license on the circuit at the time, because it wasn't a race circuit anymore, you mm. weren't allowed to overtake. So if you caught the car in front, you had to wait and you couldn't be overtaken. Um, obviously you drove a Lotus, um, which have a history, shall we say, and a, a reputation. Uh, what, what happened on the day, Gillian? Uh, very embarrassing, very embarrassing. Uh, <clears throat> because we were, we'd just taken the record at Chelsea and everyone expected it to go quickly and it was a quick little car. So they set me off uh, first and uh, I charged off for a whole lap and uh, I got halfway around the lap and then the, the, uh, we had fuel starvation and I petered to about 20 miles an hour. Everybody caught me up, went back to the pits. The other three had to have reruns. This happened twice, would you believe it? So I was responsible for the organizers um, who were very lovely about it. Um, We've got a picture of the Lotus on the screen now. Yes, that's the Lotus. Um, so that was embarrassing. So that was a morning runs over and I, I, I had a disastrous time. Re renewed all the fuel lines in the lunch break as a desperate issue. And we found that the fuel lines were contracting under pressure. So it would uh, work for a bit and then uh, starve the engine. Anyway, so knowing that I was a nuisance, they decided to set me off at the back of the four for the first runs. And um, so I set off and caught up with the next person. So I-, I, I really fairness, would you clarify, the car was a nuisance, not you, Gillian. <laughs> no, 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 I think I was a nuisance in everybody's eyes. So anyway, so I had to have a rerun for my first run. I went again and they set me off. I think, that, I think they were in despair then. I think I went off on my own. I think they thought, well, we're not gonna put it with anybody else. Just go on your own and see what happens. And the car went like a dingbat, although I didn't know good, but it was good enough for FTD by a clear margin. So I didn't have to take my second run, but I decided that I wanted to check the car out and make sure it was okay. So I went out for my second run and uh, it was winging it round. And I entered the Lavent straight with more revs, more miles per hour, more, I knew it was a quicker time, but then I thought to myself, well, you know, we've already got FTD, it's not my car, you know, just just go take it easy, look after the car, come back to the pits, collect the prize, give them a car back and say, thank you very much. And I made a big, big mistake in my racing career is um, the Lotus would have been probably doing 140-ish, I don't know exactly but it, it would have been going quickly at the end of the straight. And instead of going from acceleration to braking where the car would have been down on the suspension, I actually eased off and the, and the suspension came up and the air got under the back of the car and in a straight line, I appeared in view to put those in the paddock uh, backwards. Luckily I went off on the inside of the circuit and spun to a halt and uh, rather sheepishly had to come back and collect the trophy. I remember Jim Brodie and Pat Brodie being there and everybody was so nice to me, but I was so glad that I didn't go off on the other side. One, because I wouldn't have survived and two, because it would have caused a lot of paperwork uh, to the club and that would have ended the nuisance day. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> a very it. benevolent view, but I, I think it's fair to say that it probably grabbed yours and everybody else's attention, yes? Yeah, it was scary. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, that, that's to do with Aston, but obviously, so to do with the MOC, but then you got very much uh, very involved in, in Aston's. Well, it started, it started at Goodwood when um, uh, uh, Goodwood had the first Festival of Speed, and Simon Draper asked me to drive uh, the DBR1 or the DBR2. And on the press day, I drove both up the hill and chose the DBR1 despite its difficult gearbox. So this uh, is 1993, and we're talking the, the DBR1 that finished second at Le Mans in 59. With Frere and Trantignol, yes. A famous car, not just any old DBR1, if that can even be a phrase well, anyway. Not many of them, but uh, yeah, it was a special one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it was a, the most beautiful car to drive. It was it was everything that Sterling said it was. You know, when you interview Sterling and he's talking about uh, DBR1, he just said they were just, part, you, you didn't sit in the car, you wore it really, and it was part of you. And the faster you, you went in that car, the more secure you felt. It was lovely. Whereas, to be perfectly honest, I drove the DBR2, which should have been an easier car to drive <clears throat> and a very simple gearbox. Uh, so much easier. And Simon thought I'd choose that one. But there were only two in the world of those. And there were, what, four or five DBR1s. So he was oh. hoping I'd choose the, um, the DBR1, uh, one, really. Um, 
but uh, anyway, the I didn't really like that DBR2, and that was not the car's fault, it just wasn't quite right, and it felt dangerous. The faster you went, the worse it felt, whereas the DBR1 was the opposite. So I chose the DBR1, but the following year I had no choice, I drove the DBR2, and uh, we did find a fault on it that was making it not particularly nice to drive, but it was sent out to America, so I never drove it in its um, good form. I'd love to drive it again, but that's probably impossible. I, I love the idea that you chose one car because there were four or five of those in existence rather than a mere two, and it's brilliant. Oh, no, I chose it because it was nice to drive. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking of Goodwoods then, obviously the, the, the Festival of Speed, which uh, um, Earl March, as he was then, Lord March, uh, uh, the Duke as he is now, Duke of Richmond, started in 1993. He reopened the um, Goodwood Motor Circuit in 1998 for the revival meeting. Um, that's grown out of all recognition now, but you were involved... Uh, very early days in that, in not just a, an Aston or any old Aston, um, but a DB4 GT Zagato. Uh, yep. I think if I think if Maria can find it, there's a photograph of you uh, overtaking um, a Ferrari at some point, driven by some chap who he was quite well known at the time, called Damon Hill. Yeah, a bit embarrassing. It's quite interesting, given that you worked with his father so much back in the seventies. <laughs> makes me feel very ill. Yes. Um, there we go. But, just, but just to put this in. Just to put this in perspective, folks, here, uh, the number 18 Ferrari there is driven by Damon Hill, and this is Gillian overtaking him in a Zagato, a car that couldn't beat them in period. But Gillian had other ideas, as you probably gathered. Well, Zagato was through this one, Gillian. Very, very legal and very correct car, but it was stunning. And although the Ferrari was quicker down the straights, um, it was Damon's first year back in, in, in classic cars. And uh, actually, what you can't see in that picture is I had Jack Brabham in the uh, E-Type, uh, absolutely trying to get into my boot so the pair of us got past him <laughs> it, was, it was great fun it was great we, fun you talk about getting into the boot i mean that that's that uh 250 gto ferrari there number 18 is actually a car that graham hill drove in period so this was his son driving it uh i think there was another one that you swapped with john Sir or he swapped with john Surtees, and you had um i think you and damon hill got a, a little bit closer on track yeah. than either of you anticipated uh, that, that's putting it politely basically um uh, John Surtees drove Nick Mason's car that year of that picture and then the following year Damon drove uh, Nick Mason's car and John Surtees drove the ex Graham Hill car and I think the, the, I think it was generally accepted that the ex Graham Hill car was probably about two seconds a lap slower than than the um, other than Nick Mason's car however um, when Damon drove Nick Mason's car we all set off and uh, he had actually this time he qualified um, in front of me whereas before I think Willie Green did the qualifying time uh, and Damon took the first drive and I caught up with Damon and overtook him. Um, so anyway, that's how it worked out. But anyway, going through going through the chicane when Damon was in Nick's car, um, there was a whole train of us going through. I've, I've actually just funnily enough recently seen the video and um, there, there was no, honestly nothing I could do. Damon missed a gear in the middle of the chicane and I slammed the brakes on and I was in danger of flat spotting the tires. I, you know, I, I, didn't want to flat spot the tires and put myself out of the race uh, and I didn't want to hit Damon so it was a split second decision and I tried to go to one side a bit so I only just caught the corner of uh, Damon's car but I did do a little bit of damage to the back of the Ferrari but quite dented the nose of the Zagato and I brake so hard that the badge which is well set up on the front of the car um, that got damaged so that's how hard the, the, the nose dive was um, so that wasn't very good form was it? Uh, I think, I think you've got the badges of memento haven't you <laughs> i said to nick i'm sorry and he said oh don't worry you couldn't do anything you know whoops yeah, yeah. you're not, not worried about a set of tires but a, a, you know a few million pound cars connecting up that's fine well i didn't want to put myself out of the race because i was sharing with uh, <laughs> Wilson, I think, that right? was exactly my point that was exactly the point yeah. uh, brilliant now you've driven um Obviously, a whole a whole range of Astons. You've driven them in the UK, Goodwood. You've driven at all places. You've driven uh, Le Mans, I believe, in an Aston. Yes, uh, one of my favourite cars um, is the DB4 GT that belongs to the Mosler family, and they very kindly recently asked me to drive it again at Goodwood, which was lovely. Um, it's a great car, and it went to Le Mans. And um, I think Le Mans, Shelsley, Walsh, and Goodwood have a very special aura about them. And when you first enter the malls and straight it's it's really quite goose pimply um it's an amazing place to be there and um although it's got two chicanes down the malls and straight now they're still very very long straights um but i enjoyed driving the car but there was a really funny incident once i've got to tell you that uh, 
one of the, I drove it there more than once, but on one of the occasions um, after the race, there are two driver races and I was the first driver in the first session. And after the race, a chap came along who had been driving a Ferrari. And I remember having a, a really lovely, close, totally safe, totally respectful dice with a Ferrari. And uh, he came over and said to the team, I must meet the driver. We had such a good dice. It was real good boy stuff, you know. And the team directed him, pointed to me and said that, we, you know, she was driving in the first stint. And well, it, it was a little bit, you know, awkward. Uh, he didn't expect that. Um, but there you go. It is a surprise to a lot of people when you're driving against them. Yeah. A girl. <laughs> a girl. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think it surprised a few people over the years. Um, Gillian, you've, you've driven, um, I, I, I dread to think how many Astons you've driven, knowing you, you've probably, probably got a note of it somewhere. Do you know how many it is in total? Really good, but I, I you know, the, the project car, um, Simon asked me again to share that with him um, at Coys, I think years ago. Um, and I've driven it at um, the Festival of Speed and again down at Goodwood. Um, uh, but the DBR1 uh, has got to be the favourite car, really. It was just lovely. It's nice to see that uh, just just see on the screen is uh, one of the people that you used to race against in the in the eighties and that in the nineties in the Aston Club, Mr. Ronnie Farmer. Ronnie, welcome. Hi. Um, I don't really think Ronnie, Ronnie's on mute. If he turns his mute off, maybe maybe we can hear. But he's he's chatting. Know, he's on mute. I was going to say uh, if he could, if you need to turn your turn the mute off, Ronnie. I, I shall get. I shall get. Can do that. Just one moment. You've done, you've done it already. You've done it. It's there. Okay. Get Sharon. You've done it. Well done. You're tech savvy. Well done. Um, um, Ronnie, Alton Park. When I had a first drive and a deep. I was just going to do that. I remembered this race as one of the earlier races I commentated. Yeah, on. He beat me. I caught up with him, and I, I was told that the Aston <laughs> drivers are so polite that you mustn't do anything rude. Uh, and so I thought, well, I better behave myself. And you learned. Everything. You learned. Everything. Well, it, you did it, it was. Right. Um, it, I think. Um, I think the first time we met was at Prescott, where you were uh, uh, known as the Queen of the Hill, and um, and I just bought the river car from oh, Tim no. Webb. And um, and that's when it was blue, and there was a problem with the engine, so we couldn't actually do a racing it, but we could do sprints and hill climbs. So we took it to Prescott, and you very kindly came over and introduced yourself. I was very honoured that you would have done that, and um, and and subsequently you gave me a few tips on on the hill, which um, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and and. And basically, um, whatever you said obviously worked because um, after that I won the class uh, three three years running. But I remember that fabulous little sports racing car which you held the record in. And and was that the Lotus? Yes, that was a Lotus. Yes, it was a fantastic car, and uh, and obviously you drove it extremely well. Well, it, it was a great privilege to drive it. And, and the second time I think that you gave me some tuition was at Thruxton. Um, by this time we'd got the river car sorted out. Dave Jack had sorted the engine out and the handling, and um, and I'd won a couple of races in it. And um, the car was going very well, but I'd never been to Thruxton before. So I thought, I know, I need tuition. Who's the best person to give me tuition at Thruxton? Gillian. So we arranged it, and um, and I think we went round in your road car, and I think we did about two or three laps with you talking me through it, uh, where to brake, where to hit the apexes, and all the rest of it. And then you went quiet and let me get on with it. Um, but I I do remember whenever I missed an apex, you slapped my wrist, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you said and you said. Now concentrate, remember what I've told you. So uh, apparently uh, in the end, I, I did more or less get it right. And got it very right, you were quick run there. Yeah. And, um, and, and on race day, I beat the two Richard Williams cars. So thank you very much for all your help and um, you, you're a, a great tutor as well. Oh, thanks Ronnie, it's good, good to see you again. I haven't seen you for years. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what Ronnie's just uh, nicely uh, segued there for us is of course that Gillian, you've uh, um, from your background and experience, you, you've spent many, many years 
uh, coaching, instructing, and that doesn't just mean sort of school days at somewhere like Fructon, it's manufacturer work and car launches. And uh, you, I think you're still involved in that to some extent, aren't you? Yes, I'm, I've stopped working for racing schools. Um, uh, really, it's, you know, it's, it's quite hard work and you do it for years and, and so on. But I, I actually enjoy doing one-to-one -one instruction and also um, Porsche Great Britain use me uh, as their instructor particularly at Castle Coombe and possibly I've just had the list through which I've got to they you know how many days can I do next year on their program so uh, you know for Porsche um, which is interesting and private work really but uh, when, I think, when, I think somebody like, when, when somebody like Porsche come to you Gillian and say you know we're going to use you from your experience whatever and you get these young hotshot drivers who are going to be um, you know whatever um, what, what do you look for in them? Well, I mean, basically, hopefully, people in the Porsche Club are, are not sort of young and arrogant. They tend to be slightly more mature and sensible. But um, <clears throat> the, the main thing is, is it, people expect you to go fast as soon as you get an instructor and they just think you're just going to teach them to go fast. What you've got to do is, is imagine it's like building a house and you want good foundations. A good foundation lap is essential to put speed on. Speed is like little bricks. Um, and you can't put little bricks on a bad foundation. So I just say to people, look, forget speed, just, just focus on the foundation lap. When we've got the foundation lap right, then we just start adding speed. And that gives them time to settle, relax, not put any pressure on themselves. And then we build up and then get going quickly. It's far better than going out there, seeing how fast they can go. Um, so that's the secret of it. But the thing about instructing is, um, interestingly, I actually, I'm a qualified riding instructor with the British Horse Society. Uh, many years ago and I think you know if you like teaching uh, it's all about improving somebody from whatever standard they start at rather than thinking they're all going to be Olympic equestrian riders or Grand Prix drivers it's just the amount of pleasure and safety they're going to be in when they've had a bit of knowledge and they look after the cars more um, it's it's a win-win situation really and and you have to be pretty brave to do it as well um, you've well, driven, uh, said <laughs> a vast number of Astons over the years. Um, without um, dis, dis, being disingenuous about it, is, is there a favourite or is, is it the DBR1 that just stands out or is there, is there anything else? It's, if you had loads and loads of children and you were asked to choose one, you'd feel very disloyal to the others if you chose one. Um, obviously the DBR1 is charismatic to drive and it's got a charismatic history. Um, but it's more about the people you're involved in with. And I think the Mosler family have been incredibly kind and, and uh, supportive. And I, funnily enough, I really enjoyed driving the Mercedes 190, which has to be the slowest racing car ever. Um, and I can remember one embarrassing day at Silverstone when there was a pace car out and I, I was supposed to catch up with a pace car and I found that a bit of a struggle. Um, but it, a lovely family, again, lovely people, lovely team. So, you know, it's it's... I can remember Sterling saying his early days with HWM, it wasn't so much about the cars, it was about the people on the traveling and the lifestyle that he had with HWM. And, and really with the cars I've driven, it's, it's the association of people I remember as much as the cars. Okay, well, talking of people, you've, you've mentioned uh, Sterling Moshes there and Graham Hill, obviously na great names, uh, Formula One drivers, Graham Hill, a two-time world champion. Um, you've met an awful, lot of them over the years, some incredible racing drivers. Is there any, any one of them that stands out uh, and uh, any particular reason why that's obviously broadcastable on a, a Sunday morning family show? No, I mean, I, I, I just, Sterling has to be the ultimate gentleman. I, I'm a great uh, fan of Derek Bell. I think both Sterling and, and Derek uh, had a gentlemanly air about them while they were top of their game. They never forgot to be gentlemen and nice people. Um, that's great. But I mean, I, I had lots of fun when I was um, associated with uh, Hay Fisher in the early days with Neville Hay, and he used to ask me to go and interview people. So at Shelsley, I can remember sitting on the grass in front of a car interviewing Jenks, Dennis Jenkinson, um, and also Rivers Fletcher and Tom Wheatcroft were there. And, you know, there were various people. So they all have stories to tell and, and they're, all, they're all hilarious, really. Well, yeah, and that, that's, and that's definitely something to do with the Aston Club. Gillian, we've covered the past uh, and the present, what you do. What's the, what's the future hold for you? You've always been a busy lady. You've always known, been very single-minded. And what sort of, pro what projects do you have that you're working on currently? 
Well, lockdown is uh, not good for anybody, but I'm really lucky to live in a country village. Um, I've always had an interest in uh, self-sufficiency farming to a certain degree, as much as is allowed. And last year was a bumper year for apples and I froze a lot. Um, at the beginning of the lockdown, I, um, some people may not like this, I put two, deep, uh, free, two sheep in the deep freeze uh, and my chickens were laying well until last week. Presumably they weren't alive when you put them in the freezer. Sorry? Presumably they weren't alive when you put them in the freezer. Uh, they were humanely and uh, quietly. Oh, I just better clarify that, probably that somebody having lamb on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Um, no, uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, there's a lockdown for the chickens as well. There's a, a bird flu epidemic and uh, the chickens are in lockdown. So that my eggs are, well, they're not free range. And in fact, the chickens are pretty cross and they've stopped laying. So that's really annoying. Um, plans it's for the future. Cornflakes for breakfast then. <laughs> yeah, I know it's bad. Um, but uh, plans for the future. I've spent a lot of the, the last sort of... Uh, few years which have been a, a complete turnaround in my life which has turned out to be a good thing. Um, I've improved the property, um, made adjustments uh, here there and everywhere and uh, got myself back on track and feeling well and um, I'm looking forward to the future. Uh, I'd like to get the Cooper out, it's the only car I have um, to compete with um, but I've also got a very interesting car which I'm not going to talk about much but I will be entering it in the non-Astin concourse as soon as we're allowed to have a concourse so look forward to that and that'll be a surprise watch, to everyone. Watch this space and always good to leave us with a teaser. Yeah, watch this space. We're, on, um, we're sort of 45 minutes in. Um, Gillian, um, what I'm going to do is, um, obviously it's a QA and a as well, it's been fantastic listening to your various stories and I think Maria, who's uh, from PR, from the Maria Glenn of the Aston Club, who's uh, hosting this, uh, do we have any, any questions for Gillian, Maria, if you can hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Um, we have got one question in the chat and then a couple via email. We've got a question in the chat from Tim Piper. Um, he says, does anyone else recall the in-car footage of the Damon Hill resetting the techo meter? I probably said taco meter. There we go. Taco. Telltale sign of Nick Mason 250 GTO. Spot the non-car person trying to read out a question. I, I, I know that story if Gillian doesn't. Yes. Go on. Okay. Go on, go on. So just remind me again what I, well, I did. Bas basically, Nick, Nick Mason uh, would let uh, Damon Hill drive his Ferrari at the Goodwood Revival, as you said. Uh, Eddie Jordan, who he drove for at the time, insisted he ran in Benson and Hedges overalls, bright yellow, very non-Goodwood. Uh, and there was a question over whether the engine had been over-revved or not. And you have a telltale on the rev counter, which tells you how far it's been revved. And uh, it hadn't gone beyond the maximum amount, but there was some in-car footage of a yellow overalled arm with Benson written down it, reaching through and resetting it down the Levant Strait. Uh, once this was shown to Damon Hill, apparently he just said to Nick, send me the bill. Yeah, yeah. I do. Something else I, I should say about uh, Damon at Goodwood. <clears throat> I thought I've got a, probably a warped sense of humour, but when, when Damon um, was driving his father's car, I thought in Goodwood spirit, and it was all good fun and a bit of a joke, I got some of the um, green L plates which have new driver written on it. <laughs> and I slapped the green L plate on the back of the, uh, his GTO or his father's GTO, uh, in the assembly area. And I thought it was quite funny, and so did a lot of other people, but I don't think Damon did, sir. And then, of course, the following year, I went and drove into him. So, uh, uh, you know, if Damon's, he won't be listening, but sorry, Damon, I didn't mean it personally. And, ju and just bear in mind that the man that needed L plates, in your, in your opinion, had been the Formula One world champion just two to three seasons before. Yeah, and I, I think when he, he went to Goodwood... pace by then. Yeah, when he went to Goodwood and, and rode a bike, he was stunningly impressive. Yeah. Um, and I think he, by his own admission, probably, he didn't really get on with the cars sliding around because his whole life has been to um, get cars to do what you want without sliding. And uh, I think his, his comment was, how do we stop it sliding about? And everyone just laughed and said, no, you just get on with it, you know. I, I, th I think it's a fair CV winning a world championship against Michael Schumacher at Formula One level, I think. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. He Not had a good car, but he did the job. Yeah. yeah. Um, Maria, uh, other questions? Um, so we've got a few coming in now. I'm going to knit back to the ones that we've had in via email just because they came in first. Sorry, everybody. Um, we've got a question from Colin and Diana of Holly House Farm. I think, Gillian, they might bring some bells with you. Um, 
John um, since school lived at Gasper House? You're not, you're not, that doesn't look like it's ringing any bells. And anyway, they said, which, which of the best, which is the best race circuit um, that you've enjoyed in racing? And would it have been the DB4 Zigato at Spa? No, I never actually drove the, the Zagato at Spa. Um, the best circuit, no, I think Spa was just in a different league uh, in that it was unbelievably fast and dangerous. Um, the Nürburgring has got to be the king of all circuits, but in this country, certainly my favorites are Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, uh, except for the two new corners, I don't like those very much. Um, Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, Donington is lovely. It's, it's fast, it's technical, it's charismatic. And of course, Goodwood because of the history uh, and Shelsley Walsh. Uh, those, those are the, my favorites. I can't really choose between them. Thanks, Gillian. And then we've got a question from uh, Wendy Silver, which is a good question, I think. Um, I would like to ask Gillian about her other interests in life, as I feel this could be an integral part of who she has um, become and what she's achieved in her life. Oh, it's interesting. Well, I've got lots of interests that nobody knows about, really. Um, <clears throat> during the last sort of four or five years, I've had a chance to indulge myself in uh, things that I like that are not cars and horses. Um, I've always liked country living and self-sufficiency and that sort of thing, but um, I do like poetry, I like music and art. And, um, I, you know, it's lovely to have a bit of personal time to, to enjoy those things and to expand on that. And, uh, you know, I think that'll be a big part of my life in the future. But I also want to go racing again uh, and I feel really fit and well again, so that's great. And we want to see you racing again as well, preferably in an after. That's we're just we're just biased. It's funny that. I'd also I'd also like to go flying again because I've had a pilot's license um, in the past, um, but I, I think realistically I probably won't go to get a pilot's license. I think if I just get checked out and go solo, um, uh, you know, it'd be nice to go up and fly occasionally. But uh, I'm I'm wary that uh, part-time pilots are not the safest, so you've got to be really careful. Brilliant. Um, we've got another message in the chat from Tim Piper. Um, he said, any stories about taking the kangaroo zagato back home to Australia? Yeah. yeah. Sounds <laughs> ominous. <laughs> no, the, the zagato uh, was purchased uh, from the factory for uh, a very wealthy chap uh, who lived in Melbourne, lived actually on the um, Melbourne Strait of the old Melbourne Grand Prix. And um, basically the car, um, the car went back to Australia for a tour around and I went and joined it and uh, the first event I remember I arrived in uh, I went to um, it was Adelaide and there was a charity auction that evening so I arrived in the morning a bit jet lagged but it was okay went to the charity doing the evening and they had an auction and uh, uh, as a an idea I said well why not why not because uh, I was going to do a demonstration around the old Grand Prix circuit why not um, auction off a passenger ride around the Grand Prix circuit in the Zagato and uh, this was added as an extra to the list that had been published well unknown known to me there was a lady in the audience who um, was well known for waving her hand at any auction and spending a lot of her husband's money and she'd had a lot to drink a lot to drink and um, anyway, at the end of the official auction, the husband thought, that's good, she hasn't bought anything and went away. And then this other extra prize came up and she waved her hand and bought it. So the next day she turned up at the, at the Grom, the uh, sensational Adelaide to have her joyride round, but she was still fairly inebriated. And uh, it was quite a tricky ride because uh, halfway round she recognized the house, I think, down the main straight that she had some friends and sure, I'll just pop off and go and see them. And down the down the straight, she put a hand on the door, undid her seatbelt, put a hand on the door and was going to get out. She was so drunk. And uh, I was sort of trying to hang on to her and steer. And it was it was hilarious. I've got some amazing pictures there, which I one day if I ever write a book, I'll put in. But, uh, you know, it was it was quite fun. But I, I love driving the Zagato there and uh, it was well received in Australia. I raced it at Colin Grove Hill Climb and then went to Malala for a race meeting uh, where everybody treated me with sort of, you know, very polite sort of, uh, well, it's just a, you know, it's just a, a Sheila in an expensive car and it won't be of any 
competitive interest at all but actually the car went well and I overtook some local guy around the first corner on the outside and after that they were just great they were really hospitable and friendly. It great sounds fun. wonderful Gillian you've had uh, have and continue to have an, an extraordinary life in uh, certainly from our perspective of motor cars and uh, uh, from the equestrian side as well. Um, Obviously, at the Aston Club, we're, we're all waiting for lockdown to lift and go racing again. And we've got a, an interesting calendar uh, coming up this this year. So hopefully we can see you out uh, on the circuit. Um, I'm conscious that we're getting up to midday on uh, on a Sunday lunchtime. So people have probably got smells of roast beef and stuff going on in the background. So um, unless anybody's got anything else uh, that's uh, burning uh, uh, questions to ask. Um, Maria, do we have anything else just to finish off or are we all done? We've got two more questions. Okay. Do, 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 do you want to answer them now or do you want me to send them via email? What would you like let's, to do? For, let's go do for it. it. Happy now. That'll take us nicely to, to midday then. Okay, we've got um, a question from Christopher. He says, does Gillian feel that there are similarities between riding horses and driving cars in terms of her skills? Definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, Ron, Ronnie, Ronnie Farmer will be nodding away to this one. I know this story from 30 years ago with, with Ronnie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you only have to look at Sterling Moss, who started his uh, competitive career on show jumping ponies. And, uh, you know, you only have to look at the lovely softness of his hands and the balance and feel and the and the need to anticipate the movement before it happens, which you have to with a horse. So, yes, I think there's a great and controlling, controlling speed. Uh, the one thing you don't have to worry about. Well, you do have to worry about cars in the old days when Sterling was driving, you had to nurse the cars. To finish the race you couldn't trash the brakes on the first lap modern cars have better um, mechanical parts and so it really becomes a sprint race and see who doesn't break down but in the old days they had to really look after the cars and i think uh, you know it's very similar to riding riding horses so yes a lot of lot of connection brilliant and then quite a nice um question to end up on um gary crouch would like to ask if it's okay um, what the prints are on the wall behind you, Gillian? Oh, the prints. Um, <laughs> yes. I don't know if I can. That, that one there, can you see? Yeah. Uh, Very good. Uh, yeah, that one there is Sterling. And uh, the one to the right is R4D at Prescott. And uh, I was in a garage um, with a friend years and years ago, and uh, there was an old calendar on the wall and the friend was talking to the garage owner and I was looking through the calendar with interest and they were surprised that a girl was looking at the calendar and uh, they made a comment and I said, that's, um, he said, I bet you don't know what they are sort of thing. And I said, well, that's R4D at Prescott. Uh, and he was absolutely gobsmacked and he said, oh, would you like the calendar? So I said, oh, thank you. So it's an old calendar, but I managed to um, tidy up the prints and frame them. So I've got a lovely one. I've got a D type at uh, Le Mans. What's R4D, Gillian? Uh, ERA, English Racing Automobile, uh, uh, ERA. Lovely no, car. 1930s Grand Prix car. Yeah, in fact, when I was with Hay Fisher, um, I found it the other day. We made uh, 50 years of ERA uh, culminating in the race um, at Silverstone. And I played it through on the VHS machine I found the other day. That was really fascinating. A good story. ERA's great story. Indeed, true, a, true, a great British brand, rather rather like uh, AMOC in itself. Yeah. Um, I think we're, so we're just getting to the point of winding up. Um, Maria, thank you so much for the questions. We're just coming up to, to midday now. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody that's joined us uh, from wherever you may be, and I hope it's been an entertaining uh, morning. Um, I've got a picture of John Simcock on the bottom of the screen there next to Ronnie Farmer and uh, Ronnie and Gillian and others will appreciate this and the, David and Anne Reid. Uh, John Simcock is muted, which I never thought would ever happen in 45 years of knowing him. Uh, but the, the ability to mute John Simcock, that's technology. That's, that's just made my day. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, the, these Q&As are very, very interesting. And Gillian, above all, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you at an AMOC meeting, hopefully this season, out in this surprise car, whatever it may be, or at the concourse. Mark Donahue will love to see that. But on behalf of everybody at AMOC, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you somewhere, somehow, at a race meeting, a social event, whatever it may be, uh, when it's going to be in 2021. Look forward to you, and take care. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, and say um, it's coming up to 12 o'clock, and uh, in true Aston Martin style, I think it's Tattinger time. <laughs> <laughs>
And on that note, thank you very much, Wanda. We'll have a good Sunday. <laughs>